My name is Mark Eisenberg. I am the senior member of WRN. That means I've been here the longest, and I'm still standing. And I do civil litigation. Talk in the microphone. Hello. There you go. <laughs> you couldn't hear me? No. Wow. I thought it was loud. Anyway, good. I was yell. So I do civil litigation, and uh, last time I talked, I talked a lot about myself and my kids and my family and my background. Wendy gave me that information this time. Thank you. So I like to talk about my work. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the cases that I have handled in the past. Um, I do a lot of uh, business litigation, a lot of real estate litigation, but I also do a lot of what we call legal malpractice. I used to defend attorneys under their e &O policies. And that was fun, but suing attorneys is a lot more fun. <laughs> and I told you guys about a case uh, years ago, about a case I settled in San Diego. We're not going to talk about that, and that was fun. But the one I'm currently handling right now that I want to talk about <coughs> is called The Greedy Brother. And The Greedy Brother um, was left a huge estate by his parents. His father built a huge empire of bowling alleys throughout Southern California. And he passed away, and he was survived by his wife of however many, 50 years or so. And she started to have failing health. And she started to have early signs of Alzheimer's and other issues that gave her difficulty <coughs> controlling her affairs. And the greedy brother wasn't alone. He had another brother and a sister, and he decided he was going to take the mother's affairs into his own hands. And it was a $30 million estate. And over the course of a year, before mom died, but after dad died, within that time, he somehow managed to get the, uh, the estate planning attorney to change mom's estate four different times. And he didn't have any authority over the estate, I and mean, the mom did. But he's, I don't know what he did, he and the lawyer, they were in bed together and they made a lot of changes to the point where basically <coughs> brother and sister were written out of the will. So I <coughs> was referred this legal malpractice case by an attorney who's handling the estate part of it in probate court, and I think you all know we don't want to be in probate court, right, Lily? Yeah. Right, so he's handling that. But I'm handling, there, there's a bunch of money that Greedy Brother absconded with and filtered through to Brazil, where his in-laws live, and he set up a foundation. He sent millions of dollars to Brazil. And the law says that if you've been wrong, especially by an attorney who owes a fiduciary to you, and you're a beneficiary of the estate that he's a fiduciary of, the law says you don't have to go chasing money out of the board. You don't have to go running around for money that he, was, that he had a part in getting rid of or absconding with. So we know that we have him on the hook for that. That's, like I say, there's millions of dollars at stake there. So I'm handling that. That's my sort of fun story about legal malpractice today. Another case I'd like to talk, I've talked about this case before, but I really like it because it really kind of, it should resonate with every one of you. Um, I recently represented a woman who is a television writer. And she wrote a show for tweeners, for girls, Kind of like this old house meets iCarly, if you remember shows. It's like little girls playing with power tools. It's pretty cool. It's very empowering for girls. Anyway, she had a deal where she gave exclusive rights to a production company for five years, and she was going to get royalties over those five years. They paid her the four years, and the fifth year came along, and they said, sue us. We're not paying. So my friend who does no litigation, none whatsoever, that should be a tip for you. I love lawyers who don't do litigation. He's an entertainment lawyer, sits on his phone all day making deals. He said, Mark, do me a favor. Uh, this woman is owed a paltry amount, $50,000. Not a lot of money in the, in, in the context of big litigation, but enough. Uh, would you please take this case to mediation? We'll get a quick settlement. You'll make your money. It's, it's easy. I don't handle this. I don't want to deal with it. I'm kind of in the middle of it. Please help me out. I took the case. I did a little homework. And I found out that this $50,000 domestic distribution case with all the licensing that's in this one production company there's, there's distribution deals going on all over Europe. So the $50,000 case quickly became like a $350,000 case. And so we were able to sell. The, the settlement of that case is a great story. It was, I, I ran into the other lawyer on the other side of the case at City Hall when one of my clients was being honored. And we actually talked, we were sitting on the bench talking. It was her client too, what a small world, right? He did pro bono work for her. I did pro bono work for her. She runs a school in Watts. We started talking, and within the hour, we had settled the case. Um, but just, it's an interesting thing because for you guys to understand that, number one, I, I love non-litigation attorneys, like entertainment lawyers, 
people who are on the phone, people making deals, people who don't go to court. He sent me this case with his fingers on his nose, kind of like, this is a dog, please help me out. And it turned out that we made wine out of grapes, right? We took a $50,000 case and we turned it into $350,000. I think we settled it for like just under $200,000. Anyway, that's one kind of example of what I do. The other one I want to talk about, and then I'll be done talking about my cases. Um, I have a client who I've represented for years, and he has a premier headhunting service. He's a headhunter for uh, executive level computer executives. They have at least a bachelor level degree in computer science, computer engineering, and he's very good at what he does. He's well known, especially in the Pacific Rim. He brings a lot of people over um, from Asia, and I work with him and my immigration attorney, who actually used to be a member of this group. Anyway, one day he calls me up and he says, you know, I've got this employee, and he's been working for me for about a year, and he's kind of a hot shot, and he's got a little bit of an attitude, and kind of a little bit of swagger, and all of a sudden, he's gone, and he's calling up all my contacts, and he's taking my client list, and he's contacting all these leads, and he's got a non-compete clause that he's signed, and he's got a proprietary information, all that stuff, he's signed all that stuff, and, you know, everybody says, well, you know, you can find these people in the phone book. Wrong. A client list, is a protectable trade secret. It is the culmination, it represents all of the hard work, effort, strength, sweat, all that you put into your business. It represents the, the finest of the fruit of your crop. And so absolutely, it is a protectable trade secret. And it is something that I go and I protect. And there is a statute in California, it's the California Misappropriation of Trade Secrets Act. And it, it's a statutory scheme. It talks about what kind of damages you're entitled to. It talks about what kind of relief you're entitled to. So we went in. I got. I went in immediately. It's called ex party on an ex party basis. I'm going to take a regularly notice motion. I went in immediately. Got an ex party TRO, temporary restraining order, handcuffed this guy, and basically that's a mini trial. That you're going in loaded for bear. You've got all your declarations lined up, all your facts, all your evidence, and you're really going in there. Full shooting match, trying to win because once you get that TRO, the case is over. It's done. We've got him. He's he's hog tied. Nothing he can do because if he violates a court order, then he's in real trouble. So we did that, and and courts rarely grant TROs. They're extraordinary relief. You don't get them unless you have a showing of really compelling proof. We were able to show all these emails going back and forth with this guy soliciting all these people that were part of my client's clientele, the client list, and proprietary information. So we were able to do that. And we quickly, quickly settled that case in a short order. So that's kind of a pastiche of things that I'm working on these days. It's, it's all in the realm of litigation. Um, I handle a lot of real estate, a lot. I'd say 40 to 50% of what I do is real estate. Um, I've litigated virtually every paragraph of the CAR form contract that everybody in the state uses when they buy or sell real estate. In fact, I remember when that form was two pages long with the TDS, the Transfer Disclosure Statement. And then Easton versus Strasburger came along and there were all these disclosures and statutory stuff, and now I think it's an eight or nine, page, nine or ten page. How long is the page? Eleven. Eleven pages. See, it's getting longer as we talk. So I, I know my way around real estate. Um, and as a civil litigation attorney in this group, I'm allowed to talk about that. I just want to step on your toes. But uh, I will open it up to any questions that you have. Wow. Yes? I thought non-competes were illegal in California. Yeah. Yeah. They're unenforceable unless there are certain very specific circumstances where you can enforce them. One is the sale of the business. If you sell your company, then the buyer uh, the, the seller is not allowed to come in and do what you're doing. That kind of undermines the purpose of the whole transaction. But, but it's, it, you're right. But in the context of everything that was going on with my, the case that I described, it was just more fuel. It was more evidence of, of misconduct. Yes. So since there's always turnover network groups and you're the oldest member, can you uh, tell the group what like the coolest courthouse you've been in? Well, absolutely. That's a great question. The most beautiful courthouse, if you ever have a chance to go up to Santa Barbara, it is a beautiful, and I have a great story about that a case I had there. We don't have time for that, but yes, that, that's a beautiful. So is the historic courthouse in Riverside, which I would never have reason to be down there for. But if you go in there, you literally feel like you're transported to another time. Anyway, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions when we have our lunch contest.